Hi, everybody. I'm Maureen Lee Linker from Entertainment Weekly, and I am so excited to welcome you to this edition of Conversations at Home with Ron Cephas Jones. Uh, please note that the SAG After Foundation has a COVID-19 fund, and for members, more information is available in the comments section of this video, so to be sure and check that out. Uh, but with Without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest today, Ron Cephas Jones, who is a star of stage and screen, has appeared in films like Half Nelson and Dog Days, and on television shows such as Luke Cage, Mr. Robot, and of course, what we all know and love him best from This Is Us. So welcome, Ron. Thank you very much, Maureen. It's a pleasure to be here with you. <laughs> oh, well, it's a pleasure to be here with you. So I want to start by saying, you know, it was a big weekend in the Cephas Jones household with uh, Hamilton premiering on Disney Plus. Did you guys do anything to celebrate? Um, well, my daughter's, you know, she's on the East Coast and I'm on the West Coast. So we kind of FaceTime each other and she had the people over, a few friends at her place. And I watched it um, here in my place here. In Venice, California. So uh, I seen the play uh, four times, uh, twice <laughs> at the public and twice on Broadway. But uh, to see it on screen was was very special, and um, uh, I, I could hardly. I mean, I think I cried to have the thing. You know. Um, yeah. I so so proud of her, and uh, just thinking about it is making me tear up again. I'm a I'm a big girl dad, so. Uh, have a really wonderful relationship with my daughter over the years. And I think the reason why she became an actor was because I dragged her around the theater for so many years <laughs> and stuff like that. So she's been hanging with me for a long time. And this just was in her blood. Her mother's a world-class singer, jazz singer. So uh, yeah, um, just a proud, proud moment. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, as you should be. It's a uh exquisite work of art and, and her work in it is really extraordinary. But we are here to talk about you today. <laughs> so um, I'm going to start with a really easy one because these conversations are primarily for SAG members. I just want to know how you got your SAG card. Um, I got a gig on Law and & Order and I had to join the union. And um, I think that was my first how I got my my union card was, uh, I got booked for an episode of Law and Order in New York down at Pier 63, where they were casting. It was the only TV show in town at the moment, man. I mean, I think every actor was trying to get on Law and Order. So I kind of, uh, I got my card from an episode of Law and Order, yeah. Amazing. Were you the, the, the bad guy or uh, the victim? I or? Sure. No, I played a father uh, of a young kid who gotten in trouble, and uh, and uh, I had to go down to the police station to bail him out. And it was a scene where I was angry with him. He was a very uh, a very uh, strict dad, and so uh, I didn't sympathize with his plight, and uh, and but the mother did, and so it was that kind of scenario, you know. Um, yeah, I actually did the scene with a good friend of mine, also. Um, at that time. So, um, yeah, that's how I got my car. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, I think that's a, a common story for theater actors. It seems like yeah. many of them have been on Law and Order. <laughs> in New York, you know, like I said, it was one of the only game in, games in town at the time, uh, as well as uh, New York Undercover and uh, NYPD Blue. Um, those were like the only games filmed in New York before they opened up Silver Cup, Silver Cup again. And then they started doing a lot more, obviously now with the studios open. You know. Well, a lot of people who you know, are not theater goers may not realize that the, the bulk of the early part of your career was on stage and you've done a, a ton of theatrical work, both in New York and Chicago and a lot of on and off Broadway from Of Mice and Men to playing Richard III at The Public. How did your experiences in theater shape and prepare you as an actor, and how are they still influencing the work you're doing today? Everything, everything. I think that to, trans, uh, to translate the work from the stage to film, there's a leap, it's a leap, you know, and I'm still learning about the adjustments, but the core 
of what you do as an actor remains the same. And my, and I only can speak for myself, uh, the ethics and the way I work is directly related to what I've learned on the stage. You know, I think um, that's where I feel most comfortable resonating the work. And it's more about an idea, everything coming from inside out as opposed to outside in. It's very much action oriented, what's already there. Um, I worked with a wonderful actor named Philip Seymour Hoffman, who directed me in two of a, two of a plays by this gentleman named Stephen Adley Gerges in our theater company called Labyrinth Theater Company. And uh, one of the things that I remember him saying to me were just three simple words, and that was, you are enough. And it changed the course of how I work, and meaning that there are things inside you that are there already that you don't have to search for. You just have to be brave enough to open up and let people see it. So it's almost like the things that we spend our life hiding is what we try to expose. And that's why, to me, acting is difficult because it's exposing parts of you that you've been trying to hide most of your life. And um, that can be difficult. So that's what translates, I think, in my work on film. The beauty about film is that you can get really up close to it and you can zoom right in to the eyes and you can actually actually see it closer and you can dissect it easier. And so it's easy to tell whether or not you're working from that place or you're working from the outside in because the camera doesn't lie, you know, and it's <laughs> truth. And so if it captures that truth, that's what the audience sees and that's what the audience relate to. Um, they actually see truth that's coming from the actor and they remember that it, it gets into your subconscious. Yeah. I love what you say about that uh, vulnerability. I had an acting teacher uh, in college who used to say, uh, acting class is cheaper than therapy. <laughs> right. Sort of a form of that, not, not to the point where you, 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 you have to always remember that it is film, it is a stage, and that there are other people around you. So you have to be safe, too. You can't jeopardize other people because of, you know, whereas in therapy, um, you're safe, but you're just there with someone else. Your therapist, mm -hmm. you, you're not, uh, other people aren't around you to where you could actually hurt other people with your words, unless it's family or something like that. So um, you have to take in consideration that you are working and that it is a set. And so you have to be respectful to the other actors around you as well and not self-indulge to, to the point where it's all about you. It really is about the story and it's about the script and it's about telling that story truthfully and honestly, you know, without being self-absorbed and selfish to where you're not taking consideration who you're working with because the whole idea is that everyone's trying to tell the story and everyone has to do their job too. So, and I learned that in the theater too. It's a collaborative thing. It's not, it's not about who's up front or whatever. It, it, it's always collaborative. Whatever the role you're playing, it's a part of the story. So you know, play your position, as they say, and uh, be the best at your position, and uh, everything else will come, uh, will, will fall into place, you know, so that's how I try to work. I think that's what resonates with William as well, you know, working yeah. from Well, with William, um, you know, you were working pretty steadily in guest star roles in television, <laughs> Uh, before you booked This Is Us, but This Is Us really made you a household name. How did the project come your way? Um, on a regular audition, uh, to, be, to be honest, um, I, I didn't expect it. I was, I was actually finally doing some television. After a long time, I started booking television work because cable and the studios started to open up in New York. Um, Broadway stages and Netflix came into town. And so... I booked like Luke Cage, um, The Get Down, both were on uh, Netflix, who was in town at the time, New York. I booked Mr. Robot, which was in town at Silver Cup in Queens. And so Bernie Telsey cast This Is Us, and I booked a lot of theater out of Bernie Telsey's office. They've been really good to me and uh, would always call me in for different projects. So I booked Shakespeare out of... Uh, his office. So I, when I went to the audition, I, I was really comfortable because I knew all those cats, Will Cantler and Bernie himself. So, but when I got the script, I knew 
I just felt like, I don't know, I, I, it's hard to describe, but I just felt like if, if I don't get this role, I'm going to be so fine with it because I don't know if there's any actor that, can, that knows this character like I do. I felt that in my heart. So I was so comfortable when I went to the audition and I was so confident that what I could bring, what I was going to bring, was going to be it. Um, whether or not I booked it or not, you, at that point in your career, you, you can't think about those things anymore because it affects your work. Um, you have to go in and do what you do and be honest and trust your choices. You, you, you try not to go in and give them what you think they want, but you go in and give them what you think they want. And hopefully that'll be what they want, you know? And you have to be confident about that. And I felt that when I went to that audition. And uh, I was so calm. And I did all the notes that I had prepared and how I wanted to structure that character and all the actions I did to the letter of what I had rehearsed at home. And uh, I brought that to the audition that day. And obviously it turned out to be enough. And uh, I was... Uh, overjoyed. It was my first major role that I had with a through line that had an arc to it. Even up until that episode, the whole season had an arc for William. From the beginning all the way to his death scene, it had a beautiful, just a beautiful arc to it. And then to be privy to the way they write, to have that character come back in flashbacks, um, that was like a blessing. Uh, 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 icing on the cake, if you will, you know. Um, it's an extraordinary show, as you know, and the way it's written, man, uh, just to be involved in that. And the actors and the crew, uh, it's a, it was like a dream job uh, that finally came to fruition after many years, like you said, of doing some great theater work, to finally get an opportunity to do great television work, to have that work that I've been doing in theater resonate on film, was a dream come true. So all that time that I had been doing theater paid off, you know? It was like yeah. the frustration of time in the journey ended up being true, you know? Like, give it time, go through the journey, and then the good things will come, and they'll come in the way that you want them to go, you know? At the timing was right. So uh, I kept my head down and just kept doing the best work that I could do every time I did a theater project, knowing that one day I'll get my shot. And uh, like the musical says, I'm not going to go over. <laughs> and that's when I walked in there, you know, in the room where it happens, you know. Um, yeah, I love it. <laughs> um, we were talking about that connection you felt with William when you read the first script for your audition. Is that a it often was it something you'd really felt before or did you feel it was pretty unique to this character no I knew him ever since I was a kid William is one of those men that I knew I could name five men off the top of my head at the time when I read the script that I grew up with um, from uncles to grandfathers to father to cousins to men on the street that I grew up with. Um, they were all the culmination, William was all the culmination of those men that I had already knew. So I already knew him. I knew him well. I mean, I knew everything about him when I read him. And then I brought a lot of those men to William. Uh, all that wasn't on the page, but the foundation for him was on the page. And that was the beauty of Dan. He gave me an opportunity to add to William, to bring to William. I think that's what he saw in the audition. He was like, I have an actor here that can actually widen and bring something to the character, bring something to the writing, to add to it an element, um, um, a jazz element, a jazz mood, an urban, uh, poetic, uh, Afrocentric, um, universal appeal that this man resonated with. Uh, um, uh, I just knew so many men, not to mention uh, famous men uh, like August Wilson or uh, James Baldwin um, in particular, um, articulate, poetic, um, passionate. Uh, so there were other scholars and musicians uh, like Miles Davis and 
that were all wrapped in that character. And, uh, um, in particular, you know, people like Baird Rustin, uh, you know, who, who, who were both, uh, who, who was also bisexual. Um, uh, so uh, James Baldwin, who was homosexual, uh, all those elements, man. When, when, when they came to me and said, we have a, we want him to shift and have a gay relationship, I thought about James Baldwin and I thought about David Rustin, two men that I admire and grew up reading uh, and knowing. And so uh, there was a pride that I felt when Dan came to me with that. It was so much more than just the fact that he was gay, but he was men that, that were uh, homosexual that I admired growing up and that my mother had taught me about in the, uh, the ability to see people as human beings uh, in their whole. And uh, James Baldwin was one of those people that I admired growing up, and, as well as so many others. So um, this is the type of inner thing that I'm talking about. Those, those elements were already there. So the leap wasn't hard to do because I knew of men like that that I was proud of. And so that's how I carried it, you know? And uh, so, yeah, um, it, it was just wonderful to be able to explore it because I knew him. You know, so uh, I just brought out all those elements and memories of those men that I used to listen to in the barbershop. So that's why that scene in the barbershop was so beautiful with Randall when he went to Memphis. He took him to the barbershop because uh, that's where those men used to hang out, you know, and uh, congregate and talk stories and make up stories. It was like a, uh, the tradition of the griot where things weren't written down but passed on by word of mouth. So. And William was a griot as well. That's why he had a book of poems that he would give to Randall in the end. And uh, that's what that poem, the book of poem represented. It represented the tradition of griots passing stories down. In this case, he wrote them down, but I'm sure he used to sit and tell Randall stories around mm -hmm. the table at some times at the night. So, and there were several scenes like that where, you know, he told them, you are, you, you, you did everything right. You know, so. Yeah. You personally share some things with William as well, a, a love of jazz and this grounding in poetry that you're just speaking about. Was all of that there coming into it, or do you think you helped that in some ways through conversations with Dan and the writers? Um, we did all of that. We discussed, I, I let Dan know in a meeting some of the things that I thought about, you know, and he was right on the same page, you know. He was like, well, I mean, I was like, um, I, he could be a musician or a poet, and Dan was like, yeah, yeah, you know, that's what we were thinking, and, you know, and so uh, there were elements that we immediately agreed upon, and then Dan just gave me the freedom uh, to put subtly those little things. I, before I actually started acting, I used to go down to a place called the New Yorican Poets Cafe down in the East Village, and it was a little haven uh, uh, for artists at the time. It was an influx, an influence of poetry reading slams, if you will. And, uh, you know, they started to come back with this whole resurrection of this art scene where poets and actors and musicians were hanging out at this spot. So I used to go down there and read poetry that I would write and be involved in the poetry slams. So um, the poetic part, again, came from me already being a poet, you know. Um, and then I did a play down there. Um, one of the directors, who wrote a play, decided to do it at the New York and he asked me to play the role. And that's how I got back into acting after studying in school years ago. I took a hiatus and just kind of didn't know what I wanted to do after college and traveled back and forth across the country a couple of times. I was a bus driver here in LA in the early 80s and then went back to New York and when my daughter was born and it wasn't until then that I got back into the art scene in New York. And, uh, but it was the poetry slams that got me back into acting. So yes, the poetry was there. I was already a jazz aficionado. I was <laughs> in college to be a jazz musician. I got involved in a play, the lights hit me and I was soaked ever since. So I took a drama class and started studying the classics, Shakespeare, Ionesco, Theater of the Absurd, um, Russian theater um, and uh, theater history. and. Uh, and, and then I became an actor. So a lot of water under the bridge, but again, I guess my point is that 
William was already there from my history, you know what I mean? So uh, I just had to go inside and remember those elements and be brave enough to bring them out in a subtle way and in a truth love. Yeah. And then you've all, you've been nominated for an Emmy three times for playing William. You won in 2018. You've also won a SAG award with the rest of the ensemble in 2018. Um, what does it mean getting that level of recognition for, for this role? Uh, it means everything. I think that's what it's all about, right? For me, it's always been about the work. I mean, to feel like the people in the industry recognize your work is everything. It's everything because it, it hopefully it breeds consistency. It, it, it means that people that are at the high quality of work will want to work with you, you know, and that's what's starting to happen is that uh, people that do quality work are asking me to work with them. And so one of the examples of that is being asked to work with Octavia Spencer on this new series for Apple called Truth Be Told. Um, so to be able to work with someone of that caliber um, an Academy Award winner, um, executive producer, um, is is wonderful, and that's the that's the beauty of it. Uh, the, the 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 awards are a byproduct of the work, but also that's what you want as an actor that people say, "Man, this guy does really good work," and I'm proud of that. And I spent a lot of years working hard. Um, and digging deep to be that type of actor. I'm um, being, having your work seen is everything. Um, yeah. It's the love and a passion that's there. And you see that other people recognize it. And like I said, the, the awards is a byproduct of that, but um, the Academies, SAG, Gold Derby, all you cats, man, have been really gracious to me, man. And, um, and I appreciate it. And I want to tell you guys that all the time, you know, I'm grateful for that because that's, that's everything to me, man, to, to people to say, Ron is a quality actor. That's everything. That's the prize right there, you know? Uh, <laughs> well, I think we're, we're just times. grateful to have your work. <laughs> yeah. well, to be nominated four times, I mean, it says a lot about the character, the writing, the ensemble, all the people that help me make that character wonderful, you know? I get letters from all over the world, Maureen, all over the world, just yesterday from Bulgaria from a woman that loved her uncle and was saying to me how much I reminded her of her uncle and that she stopped crying every time she watched This Is Us. And um, I've had people that said, you know, I can hardly watch the show anymore because I miss you so much. And <laughs> I still watch hoping that we're gonna see you again. So the love, the intense love that I've gotten from the audience is even more of a testament to the work that I put in and the quality work that Dan's bringing to that show. I mean, if you could read some of those letters, it just, it's overwhelming, man. So uh, that's what I'm grateful for. And so everything else like is, a, is icing on the cake, man. Uh, <laughs> I just hope I can continue to do that, that type of work. And so far it's starting to happen and that's a dream come true. Yeah. Well, as you said, um, after season one, it's uh, we never know when you're going to pop up because it's restricted to flashbacks or dream sequences. Um, what is that experience like for you? Like every year, are you are you wondering like, oh, what's going to happen? How I'm going to come back? And do they usually surprise you when when uh, when you find out like how, how exactly it's playing out? I'm, I'm Marine, I'm full of anxiety most of the time. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm just anxious, man. I don't know. Uh, I don't know until the season starts. Some, I think one year we knew prior to that I was going to be in like four episodes. I think that was the second season. So I kind of knew that. But the third and fourth season, I didn't know a lot until actually the episodes were starting to come up. And then maybe... One episode, at the most, two episodes prior to, I would get a notice and say, uh, contract's in for you to come in and do episode this and episode that. And so then it's about trying to get the script as soon as possible to see what it is that I'm going to be doing. So um, you don't always get that uh, very early. So you know you're going to work, but you don't know in what capacity. <laughs> you don't know if it's going to be three scenes, two scenes, one episode, one line. You just don't know until maybe maybe a week before the episode sometimes. And then you'll get, they'll send you the script 
and then you're like, oh, wow, okay. Then it's about, you know, going back, going over what it is and trying to make the connection between what has happened and what's going to happen. Yeah. Well, this season, you had perhaps the wildest uh, section yet where you were in this episode that was uh, most almost entirely a fantasy, and it was these different uh, alternate versions of history that Randall was imagining uh, where, you know, you, you got better and you lived past Memphis, or one where you never even really got to know him because of the timing of when he came to meet William. Um, you know, what what was that challenge like? Because in some ways, you're not just William, you're you're the William of Randall's imagination. That was difficult. That's what kept tripping me up. Every time I went to do something, I was reminded that it's not your interpretation, it's Randall's interpretation. Mm. So I didn't have Sterling there to give me any advice about that, which would, would have been ideal <laughs> to say, you know, and like say for instance, if he had directed that scene or something. So it was really about with the director making sure that I was doing Randall's interpretation and not William's interpretation, which both are very similar, but there were some smaller nuances that I had to remind myself that uh, it was Randall's idea and dream about what he thought, how William would react. And that was the hard part, trying to get into Randall's head mm. without really knowing, you know, so I did, worked with the director very closely and the writer to dissect the words more and listen to really carefully what exactly is he saying and would Randall or William say it like that or, or how would Randall say it so it was meticulous in that way that we had to keep in mind because I was like well he wouldn't do this he wouldn't leave that out he wouldn't I mean he wouldn't have this thing laying on the kitchen thing because he would put it away before he entered the door and why are we seeing the, uh, the stuff? And, you know, it's like, no, this is Randall's. Oh, yeah, okay. And so it was kind of that, you know, it was like, well, why am I sitting here? I usually sit there. No, no, it's Randall's thing. And, uh, oh, yeah, that's right. And uh, so it was like a lot of touch and go until I could yeah. get the rhythm of it, you know. And so it was meticulous. But uh, hopefully it turned out okay. Like I said, the camera doesn't lie, you know, so it'll pick up all those little things. And then you get a sense that, okay, this is, this is Randall's interpretation of what it would be, i.e., you know, the second scene where he slams the door. So the whole idea was not really looking at Randall, um, uh, Niles character Randall, but looking mm -hmm. at, 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 at Jack, and then the anger being spewed at him. It's that feeling of being ignored. Mm -hmm. And so we decided, don't look at Niles, look at Jack, and just totally ignore the kid and answer the question to Jack and then let your eyes drop on the kid for a second and then close the door so that there's no recognition that you want to acknowledge that he's your kid. So there were little things like that, little meticulous things that we hopefully put into there that resonated, that made yeah. the difference between my interpretation and Randall's interpretation. Just that extra little filter to run it through. Um, did you find one of those versions more interesting to explore, either the, you know, never meeting Randall or the uh, everything went perfectly and William survived and had a full recovery? I think, um, well, the latter, the latter was a little more easier because it was so fast. Mm. You didn't invest much in it. The, the former, the first meeting him, was difficult because I had never met Niles in that way. Oh, wow. So really about a first. It was my first scene with Niles. So the energy that he brought was so different from the energy that I had felt before from Randall. I had never met and saw Niles and never met and saw Randall at that age. So that was a first for the first day. So I had to understand that I'm meeting my son in a way that I've never met him before, and I've never acted in this series before, where you see William and a younger Randall. So that was the trip. Looking into Niall's face and seeing my son was a different than looking in Randall's face and seeing my son. But then eventually, I got to the point where looking at Niall's felt just like looking at Randall. So it was a process 
by which I had to keep looking at Niles for the whole time, even when we weren't shooting. I just kept looking at him and just looking at him. And then eventually he started to transform into the older Randall from a younger perspective. And so also my imagination was like Randall's. I had never met him before. So it was a first. So that was a little bit easier because it was a moment that had never happened before. So it was really real because I had never met Niles before or worked with Niles before. I met him, but never worked with him as Randall. So it was my first time seeing him as Randall, just as it was William's first time seeing him as Randall. So again, playing the truth of the matter and not trying to make it feel like, oh, it's my first time. It was like, no, bro, actually, this is your first time. So how does it feel to be in the room with Niles for the first time? You know, and so I looked at him as Niles, as Ron would look at Niles, a kid, and, and then I just, tears came to my eyes because he's such a beautiful young man and uh, so well endowed with this gift of acting and intelligent and smart. And so I was taken aback by his presence and I let his energy, and that's what I felt from this kid. And it was wonderful. And it actually put tears in my eyes because, uh, that's the energy that he was able to bring to me. So we, we worked in a collaborative way in that way without even talking. And uh, I was happy that he had that, he brought that energy to it. So he helped yeah. me in that respect. And hopefully I helped him in that respect as well. And that's how that scene came on. Well, and you've only worked with Milo a handful of times as well, right? So I'm sure that was an extra boon. <laughs> I'm actually, yeah, man, I mean, I just remembered that scene where he goes on the bench by the tree for the first time he actually talks with Jack, you know, he says, um, you did a good job. I'm glad to meet you. And, um, but it was actually the first time we had this dream scene where we were on the couch laughing together, uh, but we didn't have dialogue. Mm. So that was kind of trippy. Um, I had always wanted to work with my, uh, with, um, Milo and uh, I don't know if they could have found a scenario better you know to have us together so even though we didn't have a lot of dialogue together just his presence there was so much fun man I as you know uh, Milo's a favorite he's an adorable man and so loving and compassionate um, so it was wonderful to be able to be in a scene with him man he's special he brought me under his wing when I first got here to LA in the show and took me out to lunch, man. And uh, we actually live in the same neighborhood. So, uh, but he came over and got me and took me to lunch, man, and said, welcome. And, you know, we talked about my character and his character. And so uh, he's a special cat, man. Um, yeah. very special. Well, I think everyone's hearts are exploding at the idea of uh, Jack and William having lunch together. <laughs> a little bit prior to this whole thing, man. I mean, he took it upon himself to bring me in and kind of put me under his wing a little bit in regards to some of the stuff that the show was going to bring and, you know, kind of welcomed me, man. And that was, uh, I'll never forget that, you know. Never forget. And his, you know, his door and phone is always open. And, uh, so, yeah, we've had a chance to communicate a little bit offset, yeah. Yeah. Um, going forward, do you have any wish list items for William, things you'd really like to see happen, or maybe other actors that you want to work with more on the show? I always work with the little girls. <laughs> and I always thought, damn, man, why did they kill him? Because I thought it would be some great scenes that William could have with the two daughters, especially with, um, with Eris's character coming out. Yes. Oh, what a great, you know, that scene where she opens up to, to Chrissy. I was like, man, I would have loved to have that scene where she could have came to me and said, you know, granddad, I'm, I want to come out. And um, so I always thought, man, because I love those moments when he's talking to them, that scene where he's on the step, he's about to leave. And um, Faith's character uh, comes and catches him running out the door. And she says, you know, <laughs> I remember one time feel like I was at my friend's and I wanted to leave, but I stayed and it worked out. And so this young girl giving this old man the knowledge, I thought was one of the most beautiful scenes that I have done on that show. So that's something that I, I don't know, 
if they could have a dream sequence where maybe one of them are dreaming about me or something and they could do something like that. But that's one thing that I missed. And uh, I am glad that I got a chance to work with Susan, uh, another really adorable, gifted actor. Uh, yeah, she's amazing. The things that we have together are precious. Um, mm. The fact that he was able to find a way to bring her in and see her as his, as a daughter, you know, and those moments were special for me also, man. So, um, to make a long story short, yeah, I've always wanted to do that. So I don't know, maybe um, maybe it's in the God in the cards, you know. Yeah, Dan and Elizabeth and Isaac, if you're listening, <laughs> make it happen. <laughs> um, well, I think This Is Us has probably more than any other show on television, the reputation of making people cry. You know you need your box of tissues when you sit down to watch. Do you feel the same way? Does it make you very emotional when you watch? Yes. Yes. I'm a fan as well. And uh, there are a lot of moments where... Um, you know, I have the handkerchief uh, close by. Um, I'm a big fan as well. So all those times that I'm not there, I'm watching. Uh, I like to watch the work, man. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a aficionado when it comes to that. So uh, even if I'm not there, I like to watch those guys work, man. Because um, everybody's doing such a tremendous job. And uh, I like watching the work. I like watching the work and my peers and my friends. So uh, I tune in a lot to my friends who have shows and are doing some wonderful things. So I try to watch these different series uh, that they're on as much as I can because there's quite a few. But um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I am a big fan. And yes, I do cry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you and me both, man. <laughs> um, well, it's a nice to go around, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, that was all my questions. So uh, that should, you know, bring us home for the day. But thank you so much, Ron, for joining us. This was wonderful. And look out for um, Truth Be Told with Octavia Spencer. They picked it up for a second season. Don't know when it's going to happen with the COVID and everything, but um, I think that's going to be a powerful series. And again, hopefully I'll get an opportunity to keep that, that work at that bar that I, that I want to keep raising. So yeah. thank you very much for having me, Marie.